last week, um, Shabbos, not last week, yesterday, so we got to the point where the Jewish people are standing on the border of the land of Israel, they're waiting to go in, and uh, they've destroyed a few very powerful, uh, some very powerful nations on the way, and the people that are left are getting rather scared. So we're going to come across over here some interesting personalities today. Let's have a look at the beginning. Balak ben Sipor is Kolashel Sayisole Mori, that uh, this fellow called Balak ben Sipor, he sees what the Jews have done to the Emirates, and he's getting very worried. Now, who is this Balak? Balak is the king of Moab over here, and uh, he wants to protect his people. He wants to protect himself as well. He doesn't quite know how to do it. We're going to see. He comes up with a, an, an intriguing idea. There are a lot of Moab is a very it's a very populous nation. There are lots of people over there, and of course they're all very very scared about what's going to be. And this Balak, who is Balak? He's the king. Now this verse over here, number five, the end, is a little bit, a little bit revealing. Because it says, well, we started off, with Vaya Balak Ben Sipor, like the first verse just pointed out Balak Ben Sipor, this fellow, he's watching what's going on. And now all of a sudden, at the end of verse number four, he's now the king of Moab. It says, Be'et Hahi at this time. Why is that? Because he wasn't really supposed to be the king at all. But because everyone was scared and Balak was a master tactician, so they decided that it was right to elevate him to, a, to the position of being king in order to be able to take care of them, to look after them. How does he do it? Let's have a look and see. Vayishlach malochim el bilom ben baor besoyer anshel anahar asher eretz bnei amoy lekroy loy. So he calls to somebody called Bilam ben baor. Now we don't know who this Bilam is. We're going to come across him though. We're going to find out. Bilam is the most famous non-Jewish magician at the time. He, he's got the most incredible power. This fellow. What is, what is he? Uh, the central dimension of his power is not, it's not might, he's not physically powerful, but rather he has the power to curse people. Balak understands that going to war against the Jewish people is not going to work because the Jewish people have just destroyed some very mighty nations and they're not going to have much trouble destroying Moab as well. So what does he do? He decides that he's going to, he's going to do something rather sneaky. He's going to try to bring in this fellow called Bilam. And Bilam is going to curse the Jewish people and that way weaken their strength in order for him to be able to overcome them. Now, it's it, the, the sages say that the word Bilam, the name Bilam, actually is a composite of two words, Bli-am. He has no nation. Bilam is an archetypal mercenary. He will sell his services to anybody who's able to, to pay for them. We're going to come, we're going to see what kind of a personality he is. He's an interesting fellow, he really is. Let's have a look and see. So he calls to Bilam and he says, This people, this nation have come out of Egypt and now they're sitting opposite us waiting to go in. Now, so he says, please come and curse the people. Ki adati es asher tevarech mevorach, v'asher to'or you are. Because I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. So the commentaries, of course, point out a very, a very obvious little question. That if Bilam can bless and Bilam can curse, so why is he asking him to come and curse the Jewish people? Let him come and bless the Moabites. And if they've been blessed, then they'll have enough strength to be able to look after themselves. They won't need the curse. So explain the commentaries like this. Something very fundamental over here about Bilam. Bilam doesn't have any power to bless anybody. The only power he has is to curse. However, in order to butter him up, in order to get him ready, he needs an awful lot of flattery. We'll see as we go along. He's got to be, he's got to be you know, fed to the whole time. He's got to be treated in a certain way. Otherwise, he's not going to cooperate. So Balak, what does he do? Balak, you know, praises him. Everybody knows that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. He doesn't mean it. He just, he needs his curses. 
So look, verse number seven. The Yelchuzik name Moavazik name Midianu Ksamim Biodom. So the people of Midian and, and Moab they go together with special charms in their hands. They have all Bilam Vidabru Elav Divrei Bolok, and they tell over the words of Bolok. Vayom Alem. He says to them like this. Isn't it this? Linu Foy Halayla. Stay over here. Sleep over here tonight. And you should stay here and I'll let you know what God tells me. <laughs> we didn't know that this Bilam was so tapped in that he only did what God told him to do. We didn't know that Bilam had the ability to know when God was going to appear to him either. But he's been given advance warning, which means that Bilam knows that there's no way that he can go and curse God's chosen people. But Bilam is going to try to pull a fast one over God. We have to admire him for his uh, optimism, right? So they stay there overnight. And God comes to Bilam at night. And God says to Bilam, who are these people that, that have come here? Who are these people that are together with you? Now, What's Pshat? Pshat is like this. You know, God is supposed to be omnipotent, almighty, all-seeing, all-powerful, right? So it seems to be a little bit of a daft question to ask, you know? But we have to work on the premise that God knows exactly who these people are. So why is he coming to Bilam and saying to him, who are these people? We'll see that Bilam chooses not to understand what God is saying. But what God wants from Bilam is for him to get up and say, oh, they've come here, they want me to do something I'm not allowed to do, but don't worry, in the morning I'm going to, say, I'm going to tell them to go home. Bilam doesn't do that. Look at the way that Bilam relates to God. You know, this King Bolog, he sent these people to me. You, you hear there's a, like, you hear the, like the, this sort of, uh, this, like this, what, what is it, tone of arrogance over here. Yeah, who are these people? Too, you know, I, I mix together with very high people. You know, I mix together with kings and with princes and with, with uh, presidents. And uh, you should know that Balak, the king, he, he happened to send these people to me. It happens all the time, right? Listen carefully, this, but listen to him. The nation that left Egypt and there. They're all over the place. There's lots of them. So he told me, go and curse these people out and then maybe I'll be able to go to war and to drive them away from me. <laughs> you notice that Bilam has missed out just a, a, small, a small little detail over here? He didn't mention what the name of the nation is that needs to be uh, dealt with, right? Because Bilam understands that if he comes to God and he says, here, let me curse the Jewish people, what's God going to say? Uh, for sure not. Are you kidding? But he right? does know that they came out of Egypt. Okay, because he's got, he's got to give enough details to be able to be given permission to do it. But Bilam thinks that if he keeps everything reasonably, you know, reasonably unclear, if everything is reasonably murky, then he'll catch God at the wrong moment and God will say, oh, okay, no problem. Let's have a look. Says God, you can't go with them. Finished. You're not allowed to curse the people, the nation, because they're blessed. Is that, that's, is that, I mean, there's not a lot of maneuverability over here, right? I mean, it, it's clear. Yeah, are we, are we all agreed that God's, uh, you know, God's reaction is relatively, <laughs> relatively uh, clear? Straight and forward. Absolutely, right? Thank you. So Bilam gets up in the morning. Listen to this. This guy is great. You've got, you got to have a lot of respect for Bilam's chutzpah. He says like this. He says to the people who have come, go back to the land that you came from. Why? Because God doesn't let me go with you. What do you understand from this? Bilam's being somewhat disingenuous over here, right? God says there's no way you can go with these people and you can't curse them because the, the nation is blessed, right? And what does Bilam do? Bilam gives over the impression that what? The only reason I can't go with you is because you people aren't, you're not important enough. You hear? What does he say? He says, 
כי מעין השם לתתי להלוך עמכם, the God won't let me go together with you. What's the inference? Again, you can hear whatever you want. If you, if you were tapped into the spiritual dimensions, you would say, oh, God doesn't want you to curse the nation, right? But if you're not tapped into the spiritual dimensions, what do you hear? You hear that God feels that this delegation is just not important enough. So they go back to Bolok. He didn't come with us. So look at but look what does Bolok do? Bolok understands the way that Bilam wants him to understand it. So he sends an even a higher power delegation. I, I don't know who went the first time, maybe it was the dukes that went the first time. Now it's the, the princes that are going this time. Please don't 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 not come to me. I will honor you greatly. Here, but Bolok understands exactly who he's dealing with. He understands that this is somebody who's consumed with a desire for honor and to be respected. So he says to what well, believe me, if you come, we will make the biggest fuss of you that you could possibly imagine. Whatever you tell me to do, that's what we'll do. Just come and curse out this people. Verse number 18. That if Balak were to give all of the gold and the silver that he's got in his home, he says, there's nothing I can do. Whatever God tells me to do, that's what I can do. I can't do anything else. I can't do anything bigger, anything smaller. I'm completely subjugated to the will of God. Interesting over here, he calls God at Hashem Elokai, my God. Which means that Bilam knows perfectly well that there is nothing that he can do without God's say-so. However, Bilam is one of the world's biggest optimists, and he imagines that he's going to be able to swing a pass one fast God, and he's going to get God to agree to let him do what he wants him to do. So verse number 19, Here, stay here tonight. The Eida, my Yosef, Hashem Dabayimi. Let's see what God says. Vayavoy Elokim, El Bilam Laila, and God comes to Bilam at night. Vayomele, Vayomele, Im Likroy Lachor Bo'an Hashem Kum Lechita. If these people came to call you, so go together with them. Vaaches Adava Shad Dabay Lech Oy Soi Sa'asei. But you can't do anything except for what I'm telling you to do. So far, so good. Tell me, if you were Bilam, what would you be thinking right now? You may be poor, the God. Now, be. now, now. What would, you, what would you be thinking? That you're going to hear something from Hashem that no one else is going to hear. That, like, I'm like privileged, like, in a way. Maybe. If, if I were Bilam, I would, be, I would be very pleased with myself right now, right? Because the last time these people came, he what did God no, say? Don't go. He says, don't go. What does he say this time? Go. Well, if, if they really want you to go, but, so you can go. But you've got to say what I can want you to say. That's okay, right? Bilam, Bilam is already on the road to a successful negotiation with God, right? God's already changed his mind once. And Bilam says to himself, you know, we'll get him to change his mind again soon. It's, this, this is going to be easy. Here, verse number 21. And he gets up early in the morning and he saddles his donkey and off he goes. You know, the sages say that Bilam has a, a very, very deep and meaningful relationship with his donkey. Okay, that got some people to look up. That's good. Okay, I mean, you know, every now and then we have to throw these things in over here just to make sure people are still awake, right? Bil Bilam and his donkey are an item. 
uh, which is going to come into, we're going to see later on, this, it's, going to have, it's going to have some repercussions over here as well. But the idea of Bilam getting up in the morning and saddling his donkey, uh, this donkey, this donkey is, a very, uh, is going to have a very central role in what's going on over here. What's interesting is, say the sages, that, you know, Bilam had a whole bunch of servants. There's no way that he should have been saddling his own donkey. But he's so excited to do this that he's, he's, gonna, he's getting up early in the morning, just like it says that Avram Avinu got up early in the morning. And Avram Avinu also saddled his donkey in order to take Isaac off to the Arcada to try to offer him up on the, on the mountaintop. There's a certain sense of excitement over here, a certain sense of like a friction of anticipation over here that he's going to do something enormous, right? And you get up, you know, when you're excited about something, you get up early in the morning and you get yourself ready, right? Here, a little bit like over here. You all got up early today, right? And you came rushing in over here full of anticipation and excitement. You can feel it. It's palpable, right? Y yeah? Yeah, no? Of course, right? So let's have a look and see what happens. Vayichar af elokim ki oileichu vitatev malach Hashem b'derech l'satan loy. And now God gets upset because he went together with them. I, I don't know, this is getting a bit complicated, no? Originally God says don't go. And then God says if you want to go, you can go. And then Bilam gets up and he goes, and God gets upset that he goes with him. What, what do we understand over here? So in order to understand what's going on, we need, we need a, little, a little bit of, of Hebrew knowledge. Knowledge of the Hebrew language. What does it say? It says like this. In verse number 20, it says, Vayom elokim Bilam layla, that God came to Bilam at night, and he says, Vayom eloi im likroi lecho boan Hashem kum lechitam. If you want... You can go itam. I'm not going to translate it right now. The simple translation is to go together with them. But the word itam is used over here. What does it say? How does he go? It says, Vayelech, sorry, at the end, at the end of the at the end of the of the page, on 858, it says, Vayelech im Sare Moab. That he went with the the uh, the, the uh, ministers of Moab. Now, the problem over here is English. In English, picking up the nuances between, the differences between those two words is very difficult. I don't know how we can do it. If you want to help, you can try and help me out over here. God says, kum lech itam. Itam in Hebrew means that you can go with them, but not be together with them. You know what? Maybe to, to accompany them. Right? Is that in English? When you accompany somebody, what does that mean? That, that you're not really with that person. You're just walking together with them, right? He's not escorting them either. They're just, they're just going in the same direction together. Itam, right? What did, what did uh, Bilam do? Vayelech im sayre mo'av. What does im mean? With, with them. As a, as a unit, right? As a cohesive unit. Which means like this. That God is telling Bilam at the beginning that this is the option. If you want to go, you can go. But if you think that you're going to go with the same ideal and the same goals that they've got, then that's not right. You can go with them, you can walk together with them, but you can't be together with them in their goal to wipe out the Jewish nation. Bilam, of course, does not pick up the nuance. He doesn't understand that. Bilam hears what? That God has told him that he can go. How is he going? He's going to do exactly what Bolok is asking him to do, which is so he goes, Vayelech im sare Moab. So now we understand that the first verse on page 860, God becomes angry. Why? Because he went together with the people. He went with the wrong, he's got the wrong intentions over here. The idea, it's, not, it's, not that the, it's not like, you know, Khalila, God is fickle, and one minute he says it's okay, and the next minute he says it's not okay. But he had the bad intentions to begin with, no matter what. Of course his intentions are bad, right? But God is telling him that, here, you, if you want to go, you're going under my, my rules, right? You're going to play this according to my rules, not yours. Bilam doesn't realize that. What does Bilam do? Bilam just keeps going along, you know, as if everything is going to work out the way that he wants it to work out. So he sends a malach, he sends an angel, but derech le satan loy. To, to bother him on the way, right? To get him to realize that he's doing the wrong thing. 
He's going along on his donkey, his she donkey, like female donkey. And these two boys are going together with him, his, his servants. Verse number 23. Here we're going to see that sometimes it pays to be a donkey. You know, you get to see things better than human beings do. The Aton, this donkey, sees the Malach Hashem, sees this angel, the Chaboy Shlufa Biyodoy, and its sword is in its hand, right? Which means that this is not this is not some kind of you know nice benign angel that's coming to help them on their way, but rather this angel is there in order to stop them from going forwards. And it, it went, it veered off the path. You can imagine, right? The, 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 the donkey is scared stiff. It sees, standing in the middle of the path, it sees this apparition of an angel carrying a sword and realizes that if it carries on, carries on going straight, it's going to walk straight into a very, a very, very dangerous place to be. So it just veered off to one side to get out of the way. And what does Bilam do? He doesn't see this. He's so wrapped up in his, uh, in, in his desire to go and you know, get rid of the Jewish people, he doesn't see the angel over there. So he takes his, his stick, his whip, and he hits, it, he hits the donkey. Gives it a couple of whacks to get it back onto, onto direction. What's it called? A crop, no? What do you mean you don't know? I think it's called a crop, the little whip that you use to hit horses and donkeys with. Okay, from now on it's called a crop. We agreed? Yeah, okay. The Amoid Malach Hashem B'mish'ol Hakramim And they're coming now to a vineyard and the Malach, this angel is standing there again. Gader Mizeh V'gader Mizeh he's, he's got barriers on both sides. V'terea Aton is Malach Hashem And of course his donkey sees thee. Watch him call it. He sees this angel, this apparition. The tilachet elakir, the tilchat says regel bilam elakir, and he tries to get out of the way. But what's the problem? There's a wall on either side, so he pushes against the wall. Bilam, who's straddling this horse, uh, this donkey, his leg gets pushed against the uh, against the wall. A lot of damage is done to his leg. He ends up not being able. He ends up having a limp for the rest of his life. So what does he do? But Yosef Lakoisa, he carries on whacking the donkey. Right? Because he doesn't see what's going on. Right now, the emissaries of Bilam, uh, working on the premise that Bilam does not see the donkey, he uh, does, does not see the angel, he's behaving, I mean, that's pretty normal. I imagine we would all do the same thing, right? But Yosef, Malach Hashem Avor. So the donkey, the, 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 sorry, the, the Malach, the angel comes back. At this point, it stands in a place where there's nothing that the donkey can do. It can't go left, it can't go right, it's stuck. So what does the donkey do? The donkey crouches down. It's not going any further, that's it, finished. And what does Bilam do? Takes his, takes his crop and he starts whacking the donkey all over again. Here. <laughs> Rabbi Oisa, I know that it's Sunday morning and I know this isn't fair, but just try to follow along with me, okay? Because this next little piece over here is exquisite. But you gotta, you gotta see, it's subtle. Vayiftach Hashem is piaton. So God opens up the mouth of the donkey. Vatoyme levilam neasisi lecha. Bilam's busy, busy whacking this donkey, and the donkey turns around to Bilam and says, well, well, what did I do to you? You've hit me, this is the third time that you've hit me. You've beat me up three times. So Bilam says, because you're making a fool out of me. If, there, if I had a sword here, I would kill you. A voice like it's not fair, right? But think. You've got to think for a minute. What, what, Why didn't you use sword for Huh? But, but you know what? That's also a kasha. Before we get to the sword, though, can you imagine for one second, you, you're taking your pet poodle out for a walk, right? 
I'm sure you've all got a pet poodle now. You're taking your pet poodle out for a walk, and you're like, you know, you're pulling it along, and the poodle's like dragging behind it a little bit, and you're pulling it along, and finally the poodle says, hey, what is it with you? Could you slow down a little bit? And instead of turning around and saying, oh my gosh, this poodle is talking. This has never happened before. This is unbelievable. We could probably make some money over here, right? Instead of doing that, what do you do? You turn around to the poodle and you say, listen, bud, I'm in a hurry. Could you get a, just get a move on? Does this make any sense? It doesn't make any sense, right? This donkey's never spoken to him in the past. And all of a sudden, what happens? The donkey says, yo, what are you hitting me for? And he says, because you made a fool out of me. Not, pardon? I don't know if you people, if you know this, but I, a few years ago, whenever it was about, I don't know, five years ago, in Monsi, they claimed that there was a fish that spoke. A speaking fish. It got a lot of news coverage at the time, maybe not in Kansas, but you know, in general. I don't know if the news gets to Kansas, actually, but whatever. The, the, uh, it got a, in, the, in the Jewish world, it got a lot of coverage. It's a talking fish. Can you imagine? It's Friday night, and you go somewhere for a Friday night meal, and, and your hostess gives you a beautiful piece of gefilte fish with a piece of carrot on top, and you take your fork, and you stick it in. All of a sudden, a little voice comes out of the piece of gefilte fish and says, hey, get that out of me. That hurts. What, what would your reaction be? You, you'd be quiet. You know, I'm hungry, right? I imagine that you'd probably stop for a moment, right? Bilam doesn't stop. He starts having a conversation with, with his donkey because it doesn't occur to him. He's so intent on what he needs to do that he's not, he doesn't think. He's not being rational. He's not being logical. He just he wants to do what he wants to do, which is the curse of Jewish people. There's a Mishnah in Pirkei Avod, in Ethics, Ethics of the Fathers, which says like this, there were ten things that God created at twilight before the first Shabbat of creation. The, right, the process of creation, there were six days worth of creation. HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought everything into being, put everything into place, and just before Shabbat came in, that, that sort of twilight zone between the time that the sun sets and before the stars come out, God created ten things. One of those things over there was a piaton, the mouth of the donkey, which means that God's not made a new creation over here. God is utilizing something which was put into place already within the six days of the creation. So it's an interesting idea. You know, God takes care of everything, right? Why did he create this at twilight on the last day of the creation? Why didn't he create it already during the days of the creation? So the answer is because God's creating over here the potential for something. It doesn't have to be. Bilam doesn't have to behave in the way that he behaves. If Bilam wished he could have done the will of God, he could have done whatever God wanted him to do, and it would have been the most tremendous sanctification of God's name, which means there may, not, there may have been no reason whatsoever to have this donkey speak at all. But the potential needs to be there because God's not going to create something brand new out of nothing. So it's done, Ben Ashmosh, it's done in the twilight zone between the end of the creation and the beginning of the first Shabbos of the creation in order to, to put the potential there in case it's going to be needed in the future. Oh, I'm sorry, what's with your question? Here, yeah, Rabbi Moshe had a good question, no? This Bilam, he's supposed to be a pretty powerful fellow, no? What's he going to do? He's being hired to go and curse the Jewish people. What's he going to curse the Jewish people with what? That they should be destroyed, right? And he's having a little bit of trouble over here with his donkey, right? And he says that if I had a sword, I would, I would kill you, right? And you're right. The, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the princes that, that, were, that were there together with him, it says in the Medrash, it says they started laughing. <laughs> You're planning on coming to destroy a whole nation and you can't even take care of your donkey? Made a fool out of him. And how, right? And how, imagine. Why doesn't he just 
make a little incantation over there and the donkey will drop down dead, finished, and he's been taken care of, no? Or let him curse the donkey that, that uh, you know, he'll turn into a giraffe, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But he can't do it, he doesn't do it. <laughs> okay, verse number 30. By Toyma Asoy no Bilam, Aloy Anochi Asoy in Ho, Asher Achavta Alai, Mooi de Chad, Ayoyma Zer, Hasken his Kanti, La Soy Slecho Koi. So the donkey turns around to Bilam. What does Bilam say? Bilam says, and you're making a fool out of me. And if I had a sword, I would kill you. So the donkey says, he's a very persuasive donkey, you should know this. The donkey turns around to Bilam and says, look, you know, and it says, I'm the donkey that you've been riding upon. Say the sages that, that Bilam used to have sexual relations with his donkey. Riding on his donkey has got, a, got like a, a, a certain innuendo over here. And then he says, Have I ever done anything like this to you before? And Bilam says, no. Can you imagine this? Bilam is he's like, a, he's, like, he's like a little kid who's just been told off, you know? He's got nothing to answer anymore. He just says, no. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Mamish unbelievable. What, one last de before we turn the page, one last detail over here. What, what did the donkey say? The donkey says, where's he gone? Why, why are you hitting me? You've hit me these three times you've hit me. The word for times that's used over here is very strange. Normally, in regular Hebrew, the word for time is pa'am. So it should really say, You've hit me these three times. And yet it says, shalosh regalim. Now, regal can also be a time. But if anybody over here, if you're familiar with the Jewish year, so maybe you know that the idea of Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot, what are they called? The Shalosh Regalim. We call them the three foot festivals, the three pilgrim festivals. Why is that? Because the Jewish people came to Jerusalem and they came to the temple and they brought sacrifices and everyone was together. But the bottom line is that the word, to, the word Regal can mean a time as well. But it's interesting, it's not normally used. No, you wouldn't turn around to somebody and say, hey, why have you done this shalosh regalim? They wouldn't know what you're talking about. In modern Hebrew, no one would have a clue what you're trying to say. So Rashi, of course, is bothered by the fact that the Torah uses the word regalim and doesn't use the word pa'amim. So Rashi says, ze shalosh regalim, remez, remez loy, atam avakesh la'akor, uma, ahoi genes, shalosh regalim b'shanah, you are trying to uproot what? A nation which celebrates the three foot festivals. Which is that the donkey is hinting to Bilam, who are you kidding? What, what do you think? You think you're going to come here and you're going to be able to destroy the Jewish nation? The Jewish nation are the people that come to Jerusalem and they serve God. Nobody else does that. You don't have a chance. But there's something a little bit deeper over here as well. The first time that the donkey did what he did, he just veered off to one side, right? The, the angel came along. He saw the angel. He could have gone left or right. It didn't make any difference. He, he went off to one side. The second time, he gets pushed against the wall because that was the only way that he could go. And the third time, he can't go anywhere. Explain the sages like this. There's, there's, a, there's a, 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 like a, a whole dialogue that's taking place without anything being said. It's as if he's coming and he's saying like this, you want to you wanna curse out the nation of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the first time he appears, this angel, it's as if he's saying, if you want to curse out the descendants of Avraham, well, you could curse out Ishmael, Avram's son, or you could curse out the children that he's had from Hagar, from Hagar later on, Keturah later on. Which means that you've got two options over here about who you can curse. The next time the angel appears, it's as if God is saying, if you want to curse out the descendants of Isaac, well, there was only one way to move, and that was against the wall, right? So you can curse out Asaph and his descendants, Esau and his descendants, but you're not allowed to curse out Jacob. 
And then the third time, what's there? Nothing. There's no, no, no place to maneuver. There's nothing to, nowhere to go. Right? So what happens? Over there, God is saying, if you want to curse out the descendants of Jacob, there's nothing you can do. Bilam, of course, he, he doesn't pick up any of this. He's got no idea what it is that he's being told because all Bilam is doing is that he's so intent on destroying the Jewish people that he's not, he's not listening to the messages. So then it says, Vayigal Hashem Eseinei Bilam, God takes away the blindness from, from uh, Bilam's eyes, his spiritual inability to see what's going on. Vayaris Malach Hashem Nitzav Baderech V'chabo Yishlufa Biyoda And he sees this fearsome looking angel standing there with a sword in his hand. Vayikoid V'yishtachu L'apav And he gets up and he bows down and he does everything that you would imagine a spiritual person is supposed to do when they see angels. So the angel says to, says to this fellow, to Bilam, Why did you beat your donkey up three times? The donkey was only doing what it needed to do. Because I was sent on the way to stop you. The tyranny are soin the tate le fanai ze shalosh regalim, and every time that the aton, every time the donkey saw me, so it stopped. It wouldn't go on, wouldn't continue. Ulai not some panai ki ata gam oisecho haragti vo oiso ech yesani. And he says like this. You know, you really need to be thankful to your donkey because if the donkey would have carried on, if the donkey wouldn't have seen me and if the donkey would have carried on, I would have ended up killing you and the donkey would have survived. Verse number 34, So Bilam says, watch this guy, he's really sleek. Watch this. Chatati, I've sinned. What's it called? Mea culpa, no? I have sinned. I didn't realize he was standing there in front of me. You hear what's going on over here? This Bilam, he's, he's like, he's great, no? He's not saying I have sinned because I went out to do something that I wasn't supposed to do, that I'm doing something which goes against the will of God. Why am I sorry? I'm sorry because I didn't realize that he was standing there. I'm, I apologize, I really do. Va'ata imra be'enecha shuvali. If, if you're really not happy with what I'm setting out to do, so please, tell me. Now, what, without peeking on, what, what would you expect the Malach to tell him? Okay. It's difficult to disagree with that, right? What, what would you expect the angel to tell him? Uh, after Bilam says what he says, what, 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 no? Somebody say something, please. Really bad. Turn around. Turn around and go home, right? Surely that bit's obvious. No, you're here. He, Bilam says to him, if you're not happy with what I'm doing, so please, tell me. And I'll, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll do it. I'm happy to do it, right? Verse number 35. <laughs> you can go together with these people. The Ephes Esadova Ashe Adabe Lecha O Isoi to the But you're not going to be able to say anything except for what I tell you to say. And he was told that before. Huh? And he was told that before. Now, now it's it, before, is you've got to do everything, that, right? All right here is being told that if you think you're going to be able to get anything out of your mouth other than what I tell you to do, then think again. Vayelech Bilam Im Sarei Balat. And he's going together with them. He, he's mommy, he is still convinced that he's going to get away with this. You hear? So the question is like this. Why, why, did, why on earth didn't God just tell the angel to tell Bilam to turn around and go home? Huh? Because God already made, made a deal with Bilam saying, no one, you will do only what I tell you to do. So God said that that's going to happen. The oh. Oh, which, mean, which means what? what? What does that mean? Ultimately, what does that mean? That God is, God is saying like this, that the, whatever's going to happen with Bilam, when he goes, it's going to be a bigger sanctification of God's name than if he just sends Bilam home now. 
You hear what's going on? Listen carefully. If Bilam goes home right now, so what's Bilam going to tell everybody? You know, I could have done it, but I changed my mind. And I felt that it wasn't the right thing to do. It was the wrong, wrong time to do it. You know, there's a thousand and one reasons why not to do it, right? The one thing that Bilam is not going to say is he's not going to say, listen, you know, I, I almost got, I, I got bested verbally by my donkey and, uh, and, I got, uh, and, I, you know, and I got told to go home. That for sure he's not going to do, right? So at this point, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God decides that what? The best thing to have happen now is fine. You know what? Come. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that whatever you say, that that's what you're going to say. Nothing else. You're not going to be able to curse them out. You're going to bless them. And through the blessings, there's going to be the most incredible sanctification of God's name. A few more verses. Vayishma bolok kivo bilom. So bolok hears that bilam is on the way. Vayetzili krasoi el ir moyav asher gvul anoin asher bigtei agvul. And he goes out to meet him. Vayyome bolok yo bilam. Listen to what bolok says to him. So Bolok's got a little bit of a critique over here for Bilam. He says, I sent you people the first time around. Why didn't you just come then? What, what did you think? Huh? That, I, that I wasn't going to honor you? By, by, why didn't you just come the first time around? Here, I'm here. But if you think I'm going to be able to say anything, whatever God puts in my mouth, that's what I'm going to say. Here, so I voice say, I don't understand. At this point, why doesn't Bolok say to Bill, I'm okay, if that's the case, go home. Huh? You hear the problem? We understand that Bilam went because Bilam is so caught up in this, in this, uh, you know, in the, in the swing of of honor and and in the money that he's going to get that that uh, he he thinks he's going to get away with this. But when when Bolok hears that Bilam can only say what God is going to say, nothing else. He won't be able to say anything else. Why at that point does he not realize that it's going to do more damage to have Bilam there than if he just sends him home? Maybe he he, under, he realizes the limits of his powers or influence. Or the Emma says, I think if that were the case, and he would send him home. Which means, at no point does Bilam say to him, "I've got to be here. God won't let me go home right now." Yeah. Well, he can only say things God wants him to say. So he he literally couldn't have said this by his own will. Okay. Ah, okay. You're, say, you're saying he's completely stuffed over here, right? There's nothing, nothing he can do or well, say it anyway. Sounds, it just sounds like he's saying... So maybe, 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 that, maybe there should be a dialogue over here where Bilam turns around to Bullock and says, go home, and, Bilam, and so Bullock says to Bilam, go home, and Bilam says, I can't. But we don't see that over here. So explain the rabbis like this, most incredible idea. There is a, a tiny moment in the day where God's anger manifests itself. Every day, that's the way the Gemara described it, every single day, there's a moment of God's anger. Bilam's expertise was tapping into that moment. He knew exactly when that moment was. Which means that Bilam is still working on the premise that even though he can only say what God wants him to say, but there's a moment in each day where that, 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 there's that momentary flare of anger and if Bilam taps into that at that moment, what will he say? God will be angry, God will be angry with the Jewish people and he will be able to say something that, which, that, which will damage them. Which means that Bullock knows that and Bilam knows that as well. Which means that both of them are still convinced that somehow or other they're going to succeed at what it is that they want to do. The stipler, the stipler God, like Yaakov Yisrael Kanievsky, the father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. So he always used to say like this, you know, when you become angry, you become illogical. You become completely irrational, right? Over here, th these people, neither of them are rational anymore. They both of them are behaving in a way which, which is it's just, it's not normal, it's just not normal. 
Why is that? Because they both of them are so intent on doing what they want to do, they're not, they're not prepared to think rationally. Maybe they're not even able to think rationally anymore. We, we all of us have done this, you know, at, at certain moments in our lives when we do things that are so stupid. They're just, they are so illogical. Because we're just, we're, we're not, we're just not being rational. At this point, both of them should have got up and they should have said, you know what, forget it, let's call it a day. I'll pay your expenses, I'll give you a little bit of, a, a little bit of an extra, an extra, you know, something as well for the, for the way. But, you know, we're, we're better off trying to deal with the Jewish nation as they are right now and not to deal with the Jewish nation after Bilam has blessed them. Which is, that's, that's what God is saying. You're not going to be able to curse them. You'll have to say only what I'm going to tell you to say. Tomorrow we'll see exactly how he curses them, how he blesses them. We'll also see something fascinating tomorrow, that the blessings are the opposite of what he really wanted to say, which means that within the blessing we'll see what the curse was supposed to be. But that's all for tomorrow.